You guys get a look at the chat. I'm having a little bit of an argument with some of our people. Oh, I'm a little ticked. Well, actually, a little more than ticked. This is not an online class. And I'm not going to gripe at you guys because you are not treating it as an online class. But some of your classmates are. And I got to tell you, it's really hard to teach online classes, and it's much harder to teach a class that's split. So if you guys are wondering about something, <laughs> yeah, I'm pissed. <laughs> Let's just come out and say it. I am. This one guy has never, ever come to my class at all, and he's telling me through the chat that he can't because of work. This was never an online class. This is a class that is hybrid that is supposed to be seated once a week. And then that's the only time we meet. Were it an online class, I wouldn't have to come here either. And I would be able to teach it from home. Since I don't get that luxury, I don't think that students should either, unless they've made some sort of special arrangements or have issues with COVID issues, which a lot of our people who are attending online do not. And a lot of our people that are attending online are not doing a good job at working with their groups. So those of you that are here have just done an excellent job. If you're working with someone who's not coming, let me know so I can throw them into a different group so we can have those people affect each other negatively instead of affecting you negatively. Okay, let me take another 10 minutes here in our once a week meeting to figure out who's where and we'll get started. Jesse Whitaker, I'm counting you absent. Elijah Pfeiffer, I am counting you absent. Andrew is here. <laughs> I got it. Chase is here. Now, the one, is that really Alex? You had reasons. I know, some people do. <laughs> Jason. Well, you guys are just doing a great job. We're going to start on looping structures today. And this is an area that oftentimes is confusing to students. So I am concerned about so many people not being in class. As a teacher, 
you try really hard to not leave things out. You know, sometimes it's hard because like you teach the same class two or three times in a week, you might forget to say something to one of the classes. You try really hard not to do that. But then when you overhear students telling somebody else, she didn't cover that at all and talking bad about you and you know it because they weren't in class that day, then it can be a little offensive. So remember, when you're hearing rumors like that from other students, always take it with a grain of salt and always think about the source. If you're talking to somebody who tends to be absent a lot, maybe you shouldn't take their word for it because it might not be a good source of information. Oh, all right, we're going to do some looping. What do we have everybody here or not? And then we're going to have some people saying, I just don't understand how to do that looping because it is a difficult area. So in week nine, we're going to get started with our repetition. We have it for a couple of weeks. So we'll have some time to make sure that everybody's got it down. But I'm going to start with the CIS 120 repetition statement. PowerPoint, the first one in our week nine module. And I do think we could run our class just fine if we were doing Zoom only. You guys have all just been doing such a great job getting things done. I don't think we'd have any trouble at all, but I would change my approach a little bit because I would expect everybody to be online. So that's why it's a concern. Well, I mean, I don't know, like, I, I, I mean, I personally like in person more because you can actually, like, at least, I mean, I think that, like, it's easier to talk to a person. It if you is. have questions, you, you know, like, we can actually bounce off more ideas. And, like, if you go to online, you have to entirely switch your mindset. Well, what we would do if, if we switch to online, just my class in particular, we would still have our synchronous Zoom session at our scheduled okay. time. So I wouldn't ever just say, oh, you guys are online now, like some teachers did last semester. I know that happened to some. I don't know how they did that. Because I just was like, oh, our class is on Zoom now at 8 o'clock on Monday and Wednesday instead of, you know, being in class. But it's still not the same as being there and being able to see what someone is doing and sharing things with each other. And I know, like, with Zoom, I get distracted super easy and I'll be trying really hard to pay attention and before I know it I'm off doing something else and I can do that in class too because I kind of have a wandering mind I have that problem but it's so much worse on zoom so we're going to keep forging ahead with our seated class because that's what we are and uh, then we'll just make adjustments if we have to on down the road we just try to keep everybody on track because it's hard in CIS and um, I was saying earlier before everybody got here yesterday, I sent out an advisee email and said, you know, do you need anything after midterms? And most of the emails that I got back were people saying things like, I want to drop my drawing class, you know, or things like that, that really don't have a lot to do with, with advising. <laughs> you know, like, go ahead, go for it. But some of the emails that I got were things that said, I'm not liking this CIS class. And that concerns me, you know? because I hate to have people in our field that would be good candidates that run across a poor class and decide that they want to change their career goal. But that's what happens. So it can be a little bit frustrating because you're like, this is hard stuff. What we're learning is hard stuff. You get paid well for learning it, but if they don't just give you the money for looking good, you have to learn this stuff. So, so it can be hard. It's a very rewarding career, but there's definitely some areas that we have to really think about and looping is one of them. So I almost forgot my important, making you think about things. Speaking of which, have you ever played musical chairs? You played it? Yeah. Have you ever? I, I'm a little. I was always little. <laughs> so I was one of those people when the music went off, if I did get a chair, sometimes I would find my body flying across the room. <laughs> that happened. And I told the other class, kind of like Bombo Bombardment, if you've ever played that game. You know, there are some people that are like pro Bombo and some people that are anti. 
and he, you know, so I was always really small, and I was always the target of about eight boys as soon as the <laughs> They all knew they were going to make a good hit. So anyways, musical chairs, kind of dangerous, dangerous, or than we think about, but at my size, it was dangerous. So musical chairs has some rules, right? How does it work? They repeat. We keep, we keep walking around while the music is playing. So the music playing is a state, right? While the music is playing, the people walk around. As soon as the music stops, what happens? Try to get a chair, right? You sit, try to sit. And there's one person that can't, right? So, so we always have that one person that gets left out. So this is a good example of repetition. We repeat walking around the chairs while the music's playing, while that, while music playing state is true. And as soon as that state becomes false, we do something, we try to find a chair. So we've got this interaction going. Before we do this repetition, before we can play a game of musical chairs, is there any setup that we have to do to get prepared? Set the chairs up. Set the chairs up. And what would be our rule? Every, we remove one chair. But how do I start? Music. Music? But chairs. How do I start chairs? How many? Well, basically, one less. But I need to know how many, right? The game would not work at all if I didn't figure out how many chairs to start with. I need one less than my number of players. So I have to initialize my play area properly. I have to get my chair set up for the game. All right, then as I'm playing, we know this is gonna happen while the music's going, we're gonna stop the music, they're gonna sit. What else needs to happen every time the music stops? Remove the chair. We have to take one chair out. So if we don't update our number of chairs every time we loop, we won't ever end, right? We will never get the game over. So we have to update our counter, our chairs of how many things we have to do. And then how do we know when the game is done? Only one person left. We got that one person left. So we have to do those same three things for any loop we want to create when we're coding. We have to get everything prepared. We have to initialize variables, whatever we need to control this repetition. Then in our repetition, we have to update something so that we can get to the end of our loop. And we have to have a condition that indicates what the end of our loop is. So musical chairs, our initialization step, we set up chairs, one less than our number of players. As we're looping, every time we loop, we remove a chair. When we get to the point where we have no chairs left, that one player is left, then we're done and we've won. And that's exactly what we have to do in code when we're setting up some sort of repetition. We have to do those same three steps. So we're going to see that as we get to going. Now, before we really think about it too much and look at it in the code, how do we do these things? A loop is controlled by a condition. In our musical chairs, if we still have chairs left, mm -hmm. right, or the music is still playing, or whatever we want to consider our condition to be in that. But in a normal situation, we saw that anytime we have a condition, we put it in a decision diamond. And our condition has a true path and a false path. So that's, that's the case of an if statement. Can we do the same thing for a loop? We can. So when we're looking at a loop or a repetition structure in our code, we're going to have our flow chart. And we're starting out in this flow chart, reading in some data, and then we're making a decision. If our decision is false, no, we're going to do some sort of process. And then we're going to check our decision again. Is it false now? No, do that process again. Is it false now? No, do that process again. And we're just going to keep repeating that process until we finally get a true decision. And in that case, then we'll continue on past the end of our loop, whatever our repetition body is. So looking at our flowchart, really the only difference that shows a loop is that we have this kind of backwards. 
arrow. It points back up to the decision or maybe even to the line above the decision, depending on how we're looking at it. So that shows us that we're going to repeat that. Now, just like an if statement, that condition that we're using to control our loop is going to use our relational operators, less than, less than or equal greater than. We're going to have that same kind of condition in our looping structure. Just like when an if statement is formed, we're going to have two sides, the left operand and the right operand of our condition. We're going to have variables or literals or whatever we want on those two sides to be able to come up with a true or a false answer. So some other terms that we have to be aware of with looping, some things that we don't hear about otherwise. The first one is an iteration. An iteration is one execution of the loop body. So if I'm looking at tires going around on a car, every time they turn is one iteration. So that would be one time of executing. The loop body is the code that's inside our looping structure syntax. And that's the code that's going to execute if our condition is true. An infinite loop is like that musical chairs game where we don't take away the chairs. It's never going to end. We never create these on purpose, but we create them often unintentionally. And that can be something that can cause us some trouble. And there's certain types of loops, so we'll be looking at those. One of them is a pretest loop. And in a pretest loop, I check the condition before I do the loop body itself. If the condition is true, then I execute the code in that loop body. So here's a flowchart. In this flowchart, I input a number and I check to see if it's valid. If it's not, I ask him to input a number again and I just keep checking. Is it valid now? Nope, keep inputting a number. Is it valid now? Nope, keep inputting. So I can use this kind of loop to validate my input, make sure that they type in a number. The pretest just means I check to see if it's valid um, before I go into my loop body. Here's some pseudocode for that. In this one, I've got a write statement that says, please enter a number. And I read in that number. Now, here's my loop code. The keyword is while. So instead of using the keyword if, I've just changed it to use the keyword while. So my condition says, while that number is not valid, write out the message, please enter a number and input a new one. So in my pseudocode, while begins the loop and while ends it. Everything in between is my loop body. And I'll just keep executing those two lines of code over and over as long as the number is not valid. It's trapping that little bit of code inside that loop. Now a post test, the same kind of thing. It's just that we're not going to check our condition until we've executed our loop body one time. It's going to come at the end of our loop. So in this case, we're going to input a number, check to see if it's valid. If it's not, we're going to input a number, check to see if it's valid. In the flowchart, it looks almost exactly the same. So it's only our code, really, that's different. We could make it look different in a bigger flowchart, but for that one, it's kind of hard. So here's one way I could do a bottom-controlled loop or a post-test loop. I could use, instead of saying while and end while, I could use the keywords repeat and until. And then I'd be saying repeat this little block of code until this condition is true. So whenever you're doing looping code, it's best to kind of read it out loud to yourself because the syntax they use trying to kind of lead you to the right thing there. So the difference is, in our previous example, we ask for a number, then we check, and if it's bad, we go into a loop. In this example, we ask for a number in the loop, 
and we just keep repeating if it's bad. So just a little bit of a nuance difference. Now, one thing that you might see, you might see instead of the word repeat until, we might see do until, some different kinds of syntax. So lots of options available for our repetition code with different programming languages. We vary off a little bit. So here's one. In this example, instead of saying repeat until, we're saying do while. So notice the difference in my repeat until I'm saying until this condition is true in my do while, I'm saying while this condition is true. So I can change it from being equal to not equal. Do I? Well, are there one word like I thought or anything? Um, none of these bottom control loops are really Pythonic. Uh -huh. um, but I didn't put like an, an end or like a break or something. Like right, because this is just pseudocode, so Python is only going to have us not indent, and that'll be our end. I was just making okay. sure. Yeah, so it's just the same. But yeah, Python understands while, a top controlled while. But other than that, we'll only be able to use do loops or for loops. Okay. Um, would that be considered an infinite loop? No. No. Right. We'll make them. <laughs> now here's one. This is a nested loop. So we saw last unit that we could have if statements within if statements and they were nested. We can do the same thing with loops. This loop is just kind of a simulation. Again, a state thing. So in this one, think about it. And it's kind of funny because we haven't had any trouble parking with all of these zoomers. So normally we have a lot of tr trouble parking. So this while loop would be while we're trying to park, we have some Boolean that is set to true. We're trying to park while we're checking the parking lot at NKM. Again, another Boolean that's set to true. We're going to keep looking for parking spots. So if a parking spot is found, we would set both our Booleans to false. We're not looking anymore. Then when we got to the end of our loop, it would say, oh, are we checking NKM? Nope. So this loop would end. We would come to our parking loop and it would say, are we trying to park? Nope. So this loop would end. So we can have loops within loops. The inner loop is going to get done executing before the outer loop gets to execute again. We need a picture graph thingy like that. Okay, so we need some examples. So if you'll go to Canvas and look at your modules, the one we want is this week nine Colab IPython notebook. So I've been learning more about these things than I would like. Let's get this one open. When you get this one open, Use the file menu to save a copy in your drive. Oops, I've got to get signed in. And you can just leave yours named like copy of or something like that so that you know you're working on yours or you could change it to put your name at the beginning. But when you save your copy, some things that I've found, I told you guys I would let you know as I was grading and figured things out. The dot IPYNB is important in the name up here because that is how it downloads the file. So if it doesn't have that dot IPYNB, I'm having to rename it to grade it. Um, <coughs> Otherwise, everything's working great when you guys go Google Drive, pick your notebook, and paste it. Now, some people, I'm not sure which class, but I've had some people that have been worried about Colab, and they've been copying.
their Python code into a .py file and submitting that. Don't do that because I have to grade those ones in a different way than I grade the Python notebook. So, you know, to try to make the grading happen as quickly as possible, I need them to all be the same. So some people are being really creative like that. Okay, this one I messed with a lot and I put some pictures in here because it was so black and white and ugly. As we get started, let's take a look at it. I'm gonna put that this is my 101 copy so I don't mess up my other class. If you click on the table of contents over here on the side, you'll be able to see the information we have in our CoLab notebook. Now, has everybody got it okay? Do you have it? Is it messing with you? So these are just images. They're not anything. It was just really looking ugly. But what I put in here are all of the pseudocode snippets from our textbook. So the prelude to programming textbook, each of these are a different pseudocode snippet that they have in this chapter for us. So if I click on example 5.1, we can see that pseudocode. The example 5.1 pseudocode uses repeat until. So it's a bottom controlled loop. Take a look at it. What is that loop doing? Yep, it's reading a number and just printing it out, right? When's it gonna end? So someone has to type in zero to get it to stop. Notice they don't tell anybody that. <laughs> it would be nice to tell us, but that's fine. That's exactly what that loop is gonna do. And it's bottom controlled because it's using repeat until. What about this next one, example 5.2? What is it doing? And what's it gonna do when it reads one? It's gonna write it out before it asks for another one. Um, what about ending this loop, how is it going to end? They have to type in done. <clears throat> Could they type in done with a lowercase d? No, that would just be another name, wouldn't it? So it wouldn't recognize that. Good. Now here's our first pseudocode of an infinite loop. Take a look at it. What's that loop doing? Can't make it happen. So it's just going to run and run forever. Now, some things about this infinite loop, just side notes that they don't really mention in our textbook, but just for you to know, this loop is an IO loop. Right, it's asking for input and it's giving us output within the loop. So we're going to be able to tell that it's an infinite loop. The computer, poor thing, is going to get a chance to breathe, right? The CPU is going to get to handle other tasks that are going on on the system when this one stops and waits for us to type in a number. IO takes time. We can also have what's called a CPU bound loop where it's not asking for input or output just doing some sort of calculations or something over and over and over and over. Those are the kind that give you the never ending hourglass, right? It's gone into some sort of infinite loop. You can hardly even control alt delete on your program or on your computer to end task on that application because it's got its CPU bound. It has the CPU locked up in that infinite loop. So your program can cause a lot of trouble. So if we have an I.O. bound loop like this, not usually too big of a deal, but if we have a processor bound loop like that, where we've got a hold of the processor and we're doing a lot of calculations, we can cause some delays. Some, it's just a little bit 
Would that be a benefit to working in CoLab? Is that you're you're not mm -hmm. technically not creating a process? You couldn't technically create a processor heavy loop because it's coming across bandwidth, and so you're not like crashing your computer. Right, we'd be that. crashing this virtual machine, yeah. the CoLab yeah. virtual yeah. machine. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you're so you're yeah. such a good thing, and actually within in C sharp, I have this other utility that we use called. REPL and it creates virtual machines for people oh, okay. to run their C sharp code. Well, the REPL people are freaking out, sending out emails saying they're not going to let us use their service anymore because it's performing so badly. And that's actually the email that I sent is if you guys would put some sort of CPU limit on your virtual machines, so students with infinite loops wouldn't be able to crash the whole <laughs> server, then maybe we wouldn't have this problem. So I'm so hoping they listen. Because yes, I have 15 students that all create an infinite loop on the Replit virtual servers. The whole thing just starts acting badly and stuff. So our loops can cause a lot of impact. So we could, I hope we don't bring down Google. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to work on <laughs> Now we have a mission. <laughs> A mission in life. <laughs> what should we do? What should we do? <clears throat> so as we go through and look at our, our collab document here, the types of loops section, the first example they give us is basically that writing numbers example. Notice though, they did update it a little bit because now they say enter zero to quit. Under this one, you'll see you have the first student activity. So if you click on that text block, this is actually a markdown document. So if you want to change it, click the edit icon and you'll see it open twice basically. The markdown code that you can change and the resulting output that's going to display. So Markdown is sort of code. It's kind of like HTML if you have a web dev class. And in Markdown code, having a pound sign says, this is a, a header. It should be in the table of contents. And since I have four pound signs here, that makes it be you know, three levels over from the top level in our table of contents. So if you want to add an image to this text block like I've asked you to, you would edit it, have your image copy to the clipboard, and then just paste down here and then you'll be able to click this same icon, the edit icon, to close the editor. And then it'll go back to that original view. So let's try it for this pseudocode. I want you to create a flow chart. Oh, we do need to change it. I need, I have a typo, your favo a writ. So let's fix that. <laughs> let's get rid of that a. I did that on purpose, see? <laughs> and then close it. Now I see anyways to use your favorite drawing tool, but I lied because yesterday they all use Raptor and I think it was actually a really good idea to use Raptor for this one. So the people that are at home, if you don't have Raptor installed, you can use Word to create a flowchart. You could use Visio. You can use Creately. Let me show it to you. Create.ly. Too many E's. That's what Creately will let you save flowcharts and things like that. Okay, so our people in class are gonna try using Raptor. Everybody else, you can try whichever. I'm gonna set the alarm for 10 minutes and let's see what your flow chart comes out looking like. It's create.ly. It's how I always put it in, but yes, it is creately.com. I don't know if it finds it well with that URL though.
Okay. I'm going to show you the flow chart I have, but I used Visio, so I didn't do a, a Raptor one. Let me see if I can get it to paste in here right. There it is. So in Visio, I made mine um, start out declaring a number as integer, write out the message, enter a number zero to quit, then input the number. Then if the number is not equal to zero, I went into the loop to write it and input another number because we have that bottom controlled loop that they, they gave us. And then at the end, I write out the list ended. So it's a little bit jankity. How's your Raptor stuff? Anybody got it working? Can you show us? I'm gonna stop my share if you would take over for us. And when you're working with Raptor, you're only going to be able to do a snip, use the snipping tool to get like an image of your Raptor flowchart because with Colab, there isn't really a good way to insert that file. So we'll see. You can show us how to do that too. Boy, it's sharing everything for us. I was able to get mine in. Um, last time I tried to get image on. On Colab, it's kind of confusing because it's how much. Uh, yeah, it jumps all that junk in there. Yeah, it puts a lot of code. Yep. Okay, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, that's just how it saves it. So in Raptor, again, we have the start. And in this case, we started our loop and then prompted them for input and wrote it out and checked to see if it was valid or if it was not zero, we asked them for another one. So in this one, we're not really checking to see if it's valid, we're just checking to see if it's zero. If it's zero, we're done. And we would write out that final message that they gave us. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna take this over again. Okay. So let's scroll down a little bit further in our document. You can come back to that flowchart and finish them up later if you're not got it quite done. The next one is again our name loop. But notice in the first example, it was a post test where they tested at the bottom of the loop for the name being done to end the loop. In this example, we have it as a pretest that happens at the beginning. And we're going to write this code in Python, and we can see why we want this loop at the beginning so that as they input a name, we can make sure it's not the word done. Because the way our original loop was, we would have printed out the word done before we checked to see if we were done. OK, so let's write it. Right now, your code cell should already be there. If it's not, you can just add a new code cell. Just try to keep it in the right place for me. We'll see if these things are just crazy. <coughs> but I'm going to start my comment block first. <coughs> Do what? Uh huh. You're going to write this code with me. So, do what? <clears throat> do you find it? Am I sharing okay on the Zoom session? That'll definitely make it easier. So let's say our script here, we can call this one example 5.5 um, name loop. yourself, of course, is the developer. So our purpose is to develop a top controlled loop. So 
So the first thing that they do in their pseudocode is declare a variable named name is a string. And of course, they're using that uppercase variable name and we want our variable names to be lowercase to conform to the Python conventions. So I'm going to set up a variable named name and I'm going to set it equal to an empty string. How could I set it equal to a space? Put a space in there, right? <laughs> Those are the kind of instructions that can make people's brains explode. But you know what to do. All right, so now we're going to write out a prompt. And in this one, we have a prompt that's two lines long. They want us to write out this message. Enter the name of your brother or sister. Enter the word done to quit. And then after that message, we're going to read in the name. So we have some choices, right, with Python. We could make this be one print statement, this be another print statement, and then line four could be an input statement. Or I could just do them all with one input statement in Python. Let's do that. So the variable we want to save this data in is our name variable. And we want to save the data from our input command. And when we run our input command, we want to give them the message, enter the name of your brother or sister. And then I want to go to a new line. So I'm going to use my backslash n and then enter the word done to quit. Now, at this point, I could put another backslash n if I wanted the user's cursor to be below these messages. I could put a space here if I want their cursor to sit there right beside it. I'm going to go ahead and leave a space at the end ready for the user to type in the name. So we should get two lines of output and whatever they type in, we should save in our name variable. Let's test it. As I run, it's setting up my virtual machine for the first time, so it takes a, a second. And then I get the output, enter the name of your brother or sister, enter the word done to quit. So it looks good. Is yours formatted okay? Come out all right? Our backslash n makes it go to that new line the way we want. Okay, awesome. I'm gonna click the stop button here. So it's kind of sitting there waiting for me to type something in. So now I'm ready to do my first loop in Python. So I'm gonna use the while keyword and we want this loop to run while our name is not equal to the word done. So just like an if statement, we format our while statement in the exact same way. While instead of if, and then our condition, and then our colon at the end to show that we're ready to have a body underneath this statement. So when I press enter, I'm gonna be indented for my loop body. Now I just input a name, so I'm gonna print it out, and then I'm gonna ask, for another name equals input. Now in our example in the pseudocode, they don't print the prompt again. They just do another input statement. So we'll try it like that and see how it works. Now I'd like to print out a message at the end. So I'm gonna add one more line and backspace so that I'm in column one and print end of list or anything like that just to show that we're at the end. Okay, let's try running it. Okay, so my prompt says enter the name of your brother or sister. Now it printed out that name and I have a new prompt Ready to type in the next one.
Notice how it looks like we're entering it twice. We're not. It's the first time it prints, we're typing it. The second time, we're printing it. Okay. Working that way, so you can tell. Are your, were your parents like mine? My parents liked to do everybody with the R names and super fun, super fun. <laughs> My sister Randy has resented it her whole life that they gave her this boy name so she could have an R. She says it's a boy name. Well, we could put that prompt again. Would that be less confusing? Let's do it. Instead of just having an input, let's copy our prompt and paste that in our parentheses of our lower input statement. So now if we run, we should see our whole big prompt so it won't be quite so confusing. So we see a new prompt now. And then I can add Ronnie. And then I'm done. So I'll type done and I should get my message that I'm at the end of the list. Everybody work okay? Sure. What's the matter? So now since we're redoing Every time we input a name, it's remaking the variable name. So uh, if we wanted to print all the little names in a list or something like that. We don't have a list. We just have that one variable. So, yep, once we enter a new one, that old name is gone. So there's no way with this. Not with the way we're doing it right now. We'll learn that in a couple chapters. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> she's always way out here. <laughs> so that looks good. Um, what if we printed our name after? One thing that a lot of people ask me about, how come we have this input statement twice? What if we just commented it out? You can watch me do this instead of you doing it. Um, let me try to do it. Let me type. There it is. I'm going to comment this out and I'm going to switch the order because this is something that beginning programmers always say. I don't like the way you have that loop, Riley. I'm going to switch it around to be the way it should be like this. And then I don't have any duplicate code. Okay, so I want you to watch me and see what happens. I'm going to print, oops. Line 13, I have a name, why are you mad at me? I ended up with some sort of weird. It's like I've lost a, uh, I just ended up with a weird um, pound sign there. Okay, so let's try to get someone in my copy and I must've got something in. All right, so I'm gonna put one in. So this is my first one. Everything looks great, right? I've got this loop where it's prompting first and then printing out the name. Everything's working great. I'll put Randy. It's all right. All of these people are going to say, but this is what I found on Stack Overflow. It's the right way. Now, what, ha what happens when I type done? Now I get done is one of my brothers and sisters. So do you see why they had the loop formed the way they did? If we ask prompt before our loop begins, we've done the initialization. That's setting up our chairs. We have got the right number of chairs set up now. If we didn't do that before our loop started, we would end up with some junk like this inside our loop. So I'm gonna put it back and we'll talk about that more as we go because that's the kind of um, example you're gonna find online. And you're going to find examples online that say break because break is a keyword that says jump out of this loop get out of it anytime you use a keyword like that you need to stop and ask yourself what's wrong with your logic why are you having to use a break or a keyword that alters the flow of your logic 
because it indicates some sort of logic flaw like that, that we should have asked for the name before we started. So we'll see those kinds of things as we go. But this one's done, it looks great. Is everybody's working before we move on from it? Got it all? Okay, let's keep going then. This one, we have numbers squared. It's not a loop of numbers. What it is is we're going to ask the user for a number. We're going to take that number and as long as it's greater than zero, we're going to write out the square of that number and then ask them for another number. So we're not doing any sort of thing with that number other than squaring it to output it. So I'm going to give you 10 minutes to write this one in Python. And I'm going to do it up here. So you can copy off me a little bit, but I don't want to do it together. I want you to try to write it on your own. And then we'll get back together and compare what we've got.
Bachi. How's everyone doing? Does it work? Your problem with my code? I think there is. Would zero just be a string? When you, that's where I kind of got stuck. I forgot how to declare the number as an integer before like line eight. At line seven, wouldn't you have to, is zero going to be a string? No, because I don't have it in double quotes. So you could just put zero and that'll, that's how you make uh, it. Python will figure it out from that. Okay. But it's a number. So that'll be enough. Oh. But then when I use that input statement, I do have to wrap it in that int function to cast it as an integer. <laughs> yeah, if I if I put in my number, oops, mine should crash. Oh, it didn't. It didn't crash, but four is not six squared. Is that how you do a squared in Python? How do you do that? Double asterisk. <laughs> Is there another way I could do it? The thing. The carrot. It doesn't like it, but it does like two asterisks. But what? is a really easy way to square a number. You could multiply it by itself. So remember you're troubleshooting here. <laughs> Any way to handle it'll work, that's okay. But you had to really square to do a power in Python two asterisks. So that says number to the power of two, the two stars. <laughs> You're good. Well, um, how can you declare num the number as zero? Just because that was the first line of our pseudocode. Oh, okay. That, that's okay. That's you declaring it as an integer. Uh huh. Even though the next line, do you like to do that? Because like the next line you have in there is declaring it as an integer. No, the next line is inputting data into it. What, but Python is smart enough. Python will decide it's an integer at that point. But no other programming language does that. So I will oh, continue okay. to try to put variable names up at the top with initial values, even though we don't need to. Oh, okay. Just to be consistent with our pseudocode. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought that also doubled as declaring it as an integer as well. Which is 
utilize the housing they use. For those. Okay. So yeah, but you're absolutely right. You're understanding that okay. exactly perfect. I'm just putting that in there to try to be consistent with okay. the code to confuse them. Gotcha. <laughs> no, I didn't. Okay. Oh, I got a lot of work. So um, when the uh, Later, Are you sure? Yeah, it's, it's, I'll ask Andy for a call. I think we can sure look at it. Okay, is everybody it's working? Let's take a look now. This is a good one because it doesn't have a lot of code. So let's make sure yours is working so we can take it to that Python tutor site where we can visualize our code executing so we can take a look at that. I'm going to copy my code. I can copy my comments or not, but I'll copy my selection. And then I'm gonna open a new browser page and I'm gonna search for that, visualize Python and go to the Python Tutor website and I'm gonna paste my code. Now I have my code here so that I can visualize it because when I'm looping, it can be really helpful to me to do this visualization. So my red arrow is sitting at the end of my block comment, ready to complete it. I'll click next. Now the next line of code is going to set up my number variable and load it with a value of zero. So here it is in memory. Now my next line wants to read my input. So I'll go ahead and type in a number and click submit and it did that line of code for me those input lines are kind of weird but we can tell now our number is eight because that's what i typed in so now we're sitting here at our while statement ready to evaluate our test condition our number is not equal zero so our condition should be true we should see our code go into the, the loop body Okay, so I'm gonna print out that number to the power of two. There it is up here, 64. And now it's asking me for another number again. So I'll just type in seven, submit, and we'll see it's back to our while loop evaluating our condition. Our number is not equal zero, so it should execute our loop body again. I can type anything in. And we should see it just continue to loop through that loop body over and over. So we can see how it's executing. Now this is really helpful because if we have an infinite loop, we wouldn't code an infinite loop intentionally, right? So it can be really hard to fix because when you look at your code, Sometimes it's really hard to see errors because you didn't mean to make those errors. You thought it was right. It's kind of like looking for something that's lost. You know that joke they always say, I bet you'll find it in the last place you look, ha ha ha. Well, that's how it is resolving an infinite loop. You wouldn't have put that code in there if you knew it was wrong intentionally. You think it's good. So how to troubleshoot, how to fix it. We have to use tools like this and things that make us be able to see where the problem is. All right, so that's good for our visualization. In this program, I think that we're pretty in pretty good shape. If everybody's is working, let's continue on. So far, these loops that we've been using have been waiting for a certain number, a certain value to be typed in. That value is called a sentinel. So a sentinel, you know, is like the guard at the castle keeping people out. Our sentinel is waiting, watching to end our loop. So if we type the number zero in, that would be our sentinel value in that loop. So the value we're looking for to end it. And they just call it a sentinel value. But now we're going to look at loops that use counters. And this is more like things that we're familiar with. Like maybe I'm going to do a report that lists how much money people have deposited in their checking account over the year. 
Well, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to loop through 12 months. For each month, I want to do something. So I could use a counter to keep track of those 12 months. Or maybe I want to do something where I want to just list six items. Or maybe I'm not sure how many times I want to do something, but something else is going to tell me, like I'm at a birthday party, and however many kids are there is going to help me figure out how many chairs I need to set up. So I might have another piece of data that's going to help me with this. But no matter what, just like with our games, we have to initialize, test our loop condition, and update our counter within our loop or else our loop will never end. So we have to make sure we're doing all three of those things. So on this one here, we're going to create a flow chart. It says, let's see. <coughs> And this one does kind of a squaring, the same as that last one. So we're going to go on past it, and I'll let you create the flowchart on your own, because I want to go to this next one. We have plenty of time. I just, if we do that flowchart, I'm afraid we might run out. So in this particular case, we're going to do <coughs> A countdown. So, so far, we've just been asking people for information. Whatever they give to us, we're using it and going on from there. In this particular case, though, we're not going to ask for any information at all. We're just going to set up a variable and control things ourselves. So, let's see if we can write this one. So I'm going to say this is example 5.8 countdown. So we're going to be exploring a counter-controlled loop. But our loop is going to be getting small. Our counter, I mean, is going to be getting smaller instead of getting bigger. So we want to start with a variable named count. And we want to set it to a value of 100. So I'll set it up. And then we want to print out this message, countdown in dot, dot, dot. And now for our while loop, we're going to be using our counter. And we want to execute this loop while our count is greater than, what do they say? Greater than zero. Oops, I left a colon out and you can tell because it didn't indent when I pressed enter. Now for each execution of our loop, we're going to write out a message, our counter plus the word seconds. So print count plus space seconds. Yeah. And then to continue our loop, remember we've got to update our counter. So we're going to set our count equal itself minus one. And then after our while loop is done, Let's go ahead and print something like blast off because we know our loop is done. I like to do these lines of code after our loop because that gives you a chance to make sure you're out denting your code and not getting those things inside the loop that don't belong there. 
So this one should be good. Let's try it. Well, it's mad at me. It says that on line 10, I'm trying to print unsupported types. So for the plus sign, I can't have an integer and a string. We've seen that before. We know that for our count, I need to cast it as a string. So I'll put the str function in front of it and put my variable name within parentheses so the str function can convert it to a string. Well, I'm so glad that happened. I've been looking for that uh, explanation for a while. I ended up finding a workaround with just yeah, well, strings. But <laughs> so remember, so glad I see that. <laughs> if you use a comma here, it doesn't get mad. It'll concatenate them fine. But as soon as we go to the plus sign, we have to do that casting as a string and it messes everything up. Right. Because, yeah, it's trying to do math with it. Okay, so now we've got our countdown. We should see the end of it somewhere. There it is. We went down to one second. Ooh, I don't like that. How come it still says one seconds when there's only one? Shouldn't it be smart enough to know? Can we make it? Well, let's tell it to. How can we tell it to? If. So within our loop, right, we could say if count equals one. And here we just want second. And then we'd have to do what else. Very good. And indent our else. Now for this if statement, be really careful. Because again, if you were to indent this line of code, we could end up putting ourselves in an infinite loop, could we? Let's run this and make sure it works. So I'm gonna scroll down. I've got, ah, one second. Oops, left my space out. See how those little changes can get you. I put my space in. One second. Make sure that I got that fixed. That looks much better. Now, let's accidentally indent this line of code where we subtract from our count. Because it's going to look like it's going to work right. Let's try it. If I look, oops. So I got all the way down to the one second before it went into the infinite loop, right? Because now, looking at my code, I subtracted from count for one to 99, or two to 99, or two to 100. But once my count got to one, I quit subtracting. So I went into an infinite loop at that point and never ended my loop. So I've got to make sure my count subtraction is in my loop body, not my if statement body. So does it matter if I put count equals count minus one at the top of all the ifs, or does it have to be equal to if? If I put it above the if, then I'm going to print out one less than what I am at this time, because uh, I've already subtracted and I haven't printed yet. So it would work, but it wouldn't necessarily be the output that we wanted. I did it with something else. Almost everything I did was the one second. Share with us so we can all see. <laughs> okay, share with us.
Is it going to let you share? You got it? Okay. <laughs> it found it. Awesome. Now, in um, this collaboratory thing, since we have all this output that's unnecessary, if you click this kind of download sideways icon, you can clear all that output. My collaboratory actually stopped showing you scroll anything when I play it. Yours what? It, it won't show anything when I uh, hit the play. Uh huh. The cell's still running, but there's nothing. Nothing coming out. out. Yeah. Here, let me stop sharing. Can you take over? Show us what it's doing to you. <laughs> I knew if we got some good enough loops going, we did. <laughs> so, if you go ahead and click that again, he broke it. What happens if you right click on it? Um, Move your copy of the information to leave the cell and try it again. <laughs> if you hover right under, you got it. Okay, let's take a look at it while it's running though. Um, scroll back down, let's look at your code. So we're saying set the count to 100, print countdown wall count greater than zero, if count equal one. Yeah, it should be okay without a space there. I don't see a problem. Oh, this one's still running. Oh, there we go. Maybe it's because two are running. Maybe so. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's better. So it's missing a colon on your while statement. Now try. We're definitely going to run into some weird things like that with Colab. So good job. That looks good. Thank you. Guys figured it out. Okay. Colab the, um, is using an IPython notebook, so if you run into it at home or tried to open it on your desktop, you can actually install IPython and then you can open it on your desktop. IPython notebooks have actually been updated to be called Jupyter notebooks, so if you see any of those kind of terms, that is really what you're using and getting experience with. Let's look at a few of our favorite things here. There's two versions of this pseudocode. We have one where we're asking the user for three things they like to do in their free time. And we're just expecting them to keep track of the fact that they've entered two or three. And then we have an update to that pseudocode where we're gonna tell them the activities that they enjoy so that they see, like this is activity number one that you like. So let's write code for the second version, the one where we output the count along with the methods. So 5.9. And I didn't put a code block in there for you. So you'll have to create one.
So we're going to ask the user for their favorite activities. So in this example, we have a variable named count that we want to start out with a value of one. And then we have a variable to hold the activity that they enter. So this is going to be a string. So we'll start out with a value of a space. Now we'll print out a message to them. Enter three things you like to do in your free time. Now in this example, we're going to notice how they're not prompting the user for the activity before we go into the, to the while loop. Just choices that we have, different kind of designs that we can use. In this example, because of that, we're gonna say we wanna execute our while loop while our count is less than four. We're starting it at one and we want three things. So we'll get done when it hits four. So the first thing that we wanna do is input that first activity. We already gave them a prompt there. So we'll just read in whatever they type. Now we're gonna print that one out along with our count. And again, we have to convert our count to a string if we wanna use the plus operator to concatenate. So we're gonna output our count. Then we're going to add a period and a space in the words you enjoy in another space. And then we're going to concatenate the activity that we input. To update our loop control, we're going to add to our counter. I told the class yesterday, I can like remember the point in time when I understood that I was able to update a variable and use the same variable in the calculation I was using to update it. So certain things like that, that might just be, oh yeah, to you, can be real gotchas to other people. And so that's why we like to practice and practice. And I like for you guys to ask questions and stuff because it can be something that nobody else is even thinking of. Uh huh. Anytime I try to think about doing the calculation within itself kind of thing, just to me, like, logically, it doesn't really make sense. Because, like, I, I think of, for example, like, uh, you know, like, how do you, know, how do you get four? You, know, you don't, you don't do, you don't do, like, four equals four times one kind of thing. I mean, you know, you, you can't, you can't get the same thing from doing this, that exact thing minus itself. It just seems like a weird kind of thing. It does, like, doesn't it? Like, logically. Yes. I mean, so my logic totally disallowed it. <laughs> Now, I'm going to go ahead and print out some message that we're all done. Print, uh, thanks, enjoy your activities. So now let's see if we've got it all working. We should be good to go. Three things you like to do in your free time. Mm, nap. That's always a fun thing. What's another one? Sleep. You know I can't put eating. <laughs> COVID watching. Okay, so those are my activities. I could put fighting with people about masks online. That's fun. Describing. <laughs> yeah, types of classes. Explaining a while loop, one of my favoriteest things. Okay, so everything looks great. Now, I could control this loop in a lot of different ways. Kind of think about it, things that we could do. What if we wanted the user to be able to type done if they didn't want to enter anymore? We could handle that, right? We could just change our while loop 
to say, well, count less than four and activity not equal done. And you could handle it that way. And then it would just drop right out if they did type in the word done. If we wanted it to run fewer times, we could. And that's one thing that I, I would like to do. Let's set up a variable to hold our limit. Kind of like you guys did in that last chapter for that word guessing game. Let's add a limit of how many guesses we want or how many things we want. And we'll set it to three right now. <coughs> so if I have that variable, that's gonna help me because that means I can get rid of these numbers that are hard coded in my code, right? Because as soon as my users come and say, well, we've decided we would like to collect five of their activities, not three. I was looking at a lot of changes just for these few little lines of code, right? But if I create a variable, and use that variable instead of having these values hard coded in my code, then it's much easier for me to update. So the first place I would need to change it is in my print statement. So instead of saying enter three things, I could output enter and then concatenate my limit and concatenate then the rest of my message. So now I'm saying print out the word enter in a space in my limit variable and then space things you like to do in your free time. So my message should come out exactly the same, but now I'm using that variable instead of having it hard coded. So that helps me in one place. What about here? I can't just do limit. I have to say limit plus one, if I want it to work properly. Is there a way I could change that while condition really easily to not have to add the plus one? Yep, well count is less than or equal, then I wouldn't have to do that and it would stop at that spot, exactly. So let's run this and make sure it's not messed up because we did make some changes. They look good, but we still have to test them. That looks good. Our message coming out still has exactly the same information and each of our print lines looks exactly the same. We got it all perfect. Is everybody's working okay? Yay, so much stuff today. Now the for loop is a different type of loop, just a different syntax. It's still doing exactly the same thing as we're doing with our while loop. So I'm gonna come back up here. You don't have to scroll up in this document, but way up at the beginning of our counter controlled loop section, I re-emphasize those three things we have to do to keep track of a counter controlled loop. We have to initialize the counter, test the counter in our loop condition, and update the counter so that the loop will end. A for loop does those things for us, but the syntax can look kind of weird. So in a for loop, I'm gonna start out, yes sir? Where are you in this one? Just in click five, plus code. Five, yeah, just click on it and click plus code and it'll add a spot. Okay, so my for loop is looking at pseudo code here. We're gonna have the keyword for and end for and then within we're gonna have our loop body. So just like a while statement, only we're using the keyword for. Now, what's important are these things here. With a for loop, we can say, I want you to use a variable named whatever, x. And I want you to give it an initial value of, say, zero. 
or one. And I want to execute this loop while x is greater than nine or less than nine. And I want to add one to x every time we go through the loop. So we did each of these things on our own manually as we were doing the while loops. But if we do the for loop, we can let the for loop take care of it for us. So the syntax is a little bit more complicated, but it'll do a lot more for us as we go. So let's look at some. First of all, right here, example 510, the action of a for loop. What's going to happen in that one? What's our output going to be? Is it going to print out the four? Is it? It looks like it. What's it going to print out though? Two? One and then two. What about three? Is it going to print out three? Is it going to print out four? No. Because our condition, it says, well, it's less than or equal. So once it gets to four, it'll end. So good, that's exactly right. You guys are seeing what it's gonna do. So let's code one here. Example 511, which is basically the same thing. So I've got my code cell here. Let's put some code in. And I'm just gonna call this for loop. <laughs> we just say try a for loop and for loops are a place where python really shines that means there's about a billion different possibilities for how you can code them and that's really cool because it gives us a lot of options with python but it can make it a little bit hard for you as you're looking things up so you might you know, if you find one example that doesn't work with what we've been doing, look for some other examples because there can be a lot of different ways of setting up these loops. Do I? Sorry. Do I still use semicolons in Python? Or uh -uh. Let's go find one. Let's do Python for loop. I have a bookmark at home, like a glossary. That's all right. We can look. So the W3 schools has some really nice. That's what I have a bookmark. <laughs> yeah, really nice stuff for Python. Some of it is not exactly things that we are to yet. So here's where we are. Their for loop is a little bit different. So with Python, we're going to be using this range specifier. So let's try it with our code. It's going to look a little different. They say they want to use a variable named count. So in Python, I'm going to start with the keyword for and then my variable name, count. They want count to start at zero and to stop when it gets to 15, and they want us to add five to the count every time we iterate through our loop. So we should just write out five and 10, right? We shouldn't write out any other values out of this loop. So let's see if we can get it to do it in Python. So I start out with the four keyword and my variable name, and then I use the keyword in. I'm gonna put this other keyword, range. So I'm gonna tell Python what range I want this loop to run. And I'd like for it to run from zero to 15. And I would like for every time the loop executes, I would like to add five to my counter. So I'm gonna put five. And then within my loop, I'm going to say print count. 
Now this should be just like that pseudocode. This is an area where Python syntax is pretty different from what our pseudocode is used to. And our pseudocode is based on C Sharp, Java, C++, all sorts of other programming languages. So it's a real common way of doing things. All right, let's try and run it. Oh, there it is. I got zero, five, and 10. And if I look at this for loop, that looks right. That's what we should have gotten if I desk check it and evaluate what's going on. So let's try some different things. What if I do another for loop and I say for count again in range, let's do 45 to 50 colon print count. So I'm using the same variable, but since I'm doing a whole new for loop, Python is going to reinitialize our variable. So the second time we run our loop, we're going to start at 45 and end when we get to 50. So here's our first loop, 0, 5, 10. And then we started at 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. So a couple questions for you. When I have this ending, value. Does Python stop when it gets to equal to this value or greater than that value? Equal. equal to. So that's a really important point because if we want it to run to get to 50, we would have to type 51 here is our ending number, right? If we wanted it to get all the way to 50. And in our increment, also, we can leave that blank and it'll default to one, automatically adding one. Up here, since we put in the number five, it added five every time, okay? So we have a lot of experimenting to do with for loops. We're just getting started with them, and we'll be working on them again next week. But for this week, let's scroll through this thing. Five, twelve has a for loop activity. Now, it's a decrement, it's a countdown. So I would have negative five in my value instead of five. Example 513 uses a variable. They say it's an expression because we're gonna use the variable in a math problem to end our for loop. That one could be tough. Might have to do a little digging to see if you can figure out how to do that one. Turn to each other, turn to your study groups, try to figure that one out. The last few, the for loop in action, we have using a for loop to display the squares of numbers, kind of like that earlier one, only in this case, we're going to print them all out, one and one squared, two and two squared, three and three squared. And then using a for loop to count by twos. I think there's some enough for you guys to try. Now, if you notice as I'm scrolling through these last ones, there's hardly any student activities until you get to this very too many beans. So you're going to see those as you go through. I'm going to open the table of contents. And as you're looking at the table of contents, you should be able to find all of the student activities. Those are the things that I'm going to grade. OK? So there are a few of them for you guys to work on between now and next time. We can do a Zoom session if you want to on Thursday afternoon. So if I get enough votes, which are messages from you guys, that you want to do a Zoom session on Thursday afternoon, we can, and I will schedule it. But if I don't hear from anybody, I've, I'll figure you're doing great, and you don't need me, which is awesome. This whole giant collab notebook should be turned in then when all of these things are done. The way the collab notebooks are working, when you submit it, 
in Canvas is it, it is making a copy of it. So you could go back and change your notebook more. It wouldn't be like you were cheating or anything. I wouldn't be looking at your new one. I would see the original copy. So there's a lot there. I want you guys to work together, get together on, on Discord, see what you can do with some of those square loops. We haven't had a chance to experiment with it a whole bunch. We have a whole nother week working on loops. So if you don't get them turned in, it's not the end of the world. What would be the end of the world is if you don't try at all, because then you won't learn them. Then you have to see what you can do. So this is due. But if I hear from a lot of you, we'll have a, like I said, Zoom session Thursday afternoon to try to help you with the rest of it. If you don't need it, that's great. Whew. We just went end to end today. Any questions before we go? If you got the impression that I'm not super firm about your due date, you're right. Because there's a lot of assignments there. I just want to see if you can get it all done. I know you can.